grace, mercy, and peace are yours through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The words from Scripture upon which our hearts meditate this morning are from our epistle lesson, that is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Dear brothers and sisters, what brings you joy? I bet if you asked that question to ten different people, you would get ten different answers. Usually, though, in answering that question, the person will conflate joy with happiness. And they are definitely not the same thing. I read an article this week called God is Found in the Difference Between Joy and Happiness. The author wrote this. Happiness is an emotion in which we experience feelings ranging from contentment and satisfaction to bliss and intense pleasure, whereas joy is a stronger, less common feeling than happiness. You see, true joy, which can be found even in the midst of sadness or heartache, is a rarity in this world. In fact, getting back to our reading from God's word, Paul had joy even while he was in prison. That's because his joy was not based on his changing life situation, but totally on Jesus. He rejoices in the Lord, even in the tough times. And that can be a tough thing to do. It would be an understatement to say we don't always have the feeling of joy. We may feel joy on the mountaintops of life, but through the valley of shadows, it's pretty hard. The sinful old world and its troubles rob us of that joy, and, and we might think that we won't have much joy until we get to heaven. But the Lord really doesn't want us to wait. No matter what the problem or trouble, the Lord wants us to have joy in Jesus. Today in the scriptures, we have before us a song of Paul, a song of joy. I don't know the melody, but Paul gives us the inspired words about Jesus. He literally sings for joy in the Lord, and he wants us to sing it with him. So we want to make Paul's words before us our ode to joy in Jesus. Paul's ode to joy in Jesus actually starts in verse 6. These words were actually probably a hymn, and they are poetic, even in English. Stanza 1 of his ode to joy in Jesus starts with something that doesn't seem very joyful at all. It's all about Christ humiliation and death. Paul writes, though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed, but he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We call that Christ's humiliation, but that doesn't mean he was embarrassed or humiliated in the way that we use the word. Like, how humiliated I was when my boss criticized me at the company meeting. But in reference to Jesus, humiliation is a catechism term to describe the entire time that Jesus humbled himself from the moment he left heaven and became a man until his resurrection. As verse 6 says, he was by nature God and equal with God. He was the Lord of the universe from all eternity. To understand the vastness of God and his universe, imagine our sun to be the size of a grapefruit. Forty feet away would be a grain of sand. And that is the planet Earth. 200 feet away, in the middle of the parking lot, would be a cranberry. That would be Jupiter. 
Pluto would be another grain of sand a third of the mi a mile away, and the nearest sun would be another grapefruit in Las Vegas, if I did my math correctly. Jesus gave up the rule of the entire universe to come to us and our tiny grain of sand because he loved us and wanted to be able to live with us forever in heaven. Even though he was God, he did something that was definitely not for his gain or advantage, but for ours. He emptied himself, Paul sings. Well, what does that mean? He still was God, come in the flesh. He was still Emmanuel, God with us. But he emptied himself of his power. He was willing to become a weak, little human baby. Why did he do that? Well, he became a man in order to die. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. If Jesus had come in all of his power and might, the world would have been amazed and astounded. But the world wouldn't have been saved. So he set all of that power aside. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The cross wasn't fun, obviously. But Jesus had joy even in the cross because he knew that it was accomplishing your salvation. So even when Paul sings about Jesus' humility and death, it is a song of joy. Because we get to rejoice that your debt to God is marked paid in full by Jesus. This becomes your song of joy when you listen to what Paul says. Did you notice Paul's introduction to his ode to joy in Jesus? Look at verse 5. Paul writes, Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You can make Paul's ode to joy in Jesus your ode to joy in Jesus when you imitate him and have the same mindset that Jesus had. Paul wrote earlier in his letter, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in Spirit, and having one mind. You Philippians, the church to whom I'm writing, even though I am sitting under Roman guard, you can make my joy complete. How? Be like Jesus. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit. You know, we can become so wrapped up in our own self-centeredness. A Chinese proverb says, the center of the universe is the navel of a man. I want the whole world to revolve around me. If I'm going to do anything, I'm going to ask, what's in it for me? Now think, what was in it for Jesus to come to earth? He received nothing but disappointment with people. Pain and suffering and death on the cross. His sacrifice of love was the most unselfish sacrifice of all. In humility, value others above yourself. Don't think so much of yourself, but put others first. That's a tall order, because by nature, we would agree with this German proverb. First I come, then I come again, then comes my dog, then you come. Now think of Jesus. There was no one better or greater than he, but he put all of sinful mankind ahead of himself. Paul says in verse 4, Let each of you look carefully not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. 
When you get up in the morning, do you think, what can I do for me today? Or what can I do for others today? When you plan activities, do you ask, what's going to make me happy or what will make my family happy? Jesus didn't need to ask such questions. Right from the start, he had the interests of everyone else in his mind. As he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So again, be like Jesus. But that's a pretty impossible task, isn't it? That's why you need Jesus for more than a role model. His perfect example of hum humility is also what accomplished your salvation. He became obedient to death, even death on the cross, to pay for your failures. And what's more, he still gives you the strength to follow him because he not only died, but rose again in victory. So we continue to sing our ode to joy in Jesus. Paul sings in stanza two of his ode to joy in Jesus. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Don't those words inspire you? Don't you just want to shout hallelujah when you read them? Jesus died. But he was exalted. He was raised up in glory to the highest place. And his name causes us to bow the knee in reverence to our Savior God. But not only us and all Christians, absolutely everyone will confess that Jesus is Lord, if not sooner than later. When Jesus comes in glory on the last day, every person who has tried to ridicule him will have to change their minds. Those who only use Christ's name when they're upset or swearing will have no choice but to confess that Jesus is Lord. Those who have forced Christians to bow the knee under the threat of death are going to end up bowing the knee to Jesus. After all, there are enemies of Jesus who are already bending the knee. They are those who are, quote-unquote, under the earth. That is, Satan himself and all the evil angels. Already, they have to admit that Jesus is Lord. They know he is God. They know he is the Savior of mankind. They just don't like it. As James points out, the devils also, also believe, but tremble. They have no choice. They have to bow the knee to the one who has the greater power. But the Lord invites all those who are still on earth in Isaiah 45, Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Before me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear. Turn to me and be saved. If you fight it, you will lose. Come to me and win. So we make Paul's ode to joy in Jesus our ode to joy in Jesus when we remember who is in control when things go bad. Who is guiding my life when I can't do it anymore? Like when you land in the hospital or you get sick. Who has already won the victory when it seems like the devil sometimes is winning? Who is coming again in all power and glory when it seems like the church always takes it on the chin? Someday every knee will bow and every tongue will proclaim. Until then, we as Christians continue to sing our ode to joy. Music has a way of making things stick and, and brings us joy. In fact, Martin Luther said about music, next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. The gift of language combined with the gift of song was given to man 
that he should proclaim the word of God through music. Perhaps some of you realize that our theme, Ode to Joy, is also a melody that was written by Beethoven. Today, let's use music to praise our triune God, the only one who is truly worthy of praise. But when the music fades, remember Paul's ode to joy in Jesus, which is now yours. That Jesus died. He rose and is exalted. He is sitting on his throne, and he is coming back again. So that whether we're in church or not, we can always rejoice and sing our ode to joy in Jesus. Amen.